Hey guys, finally, the last lecture for chapter five. I can't believe how long I've been trying to videotape this and uh, hopefully this week I'll be going crazy with lectures so that next week when you guys get to, to the chapter six, you will be uh, well stocked with lectures. At any rate, subliminal perception. This one comes with a, with a short personal story. Um, when I was an undergraduate uh, and I was thinking of graduate schools, I was also a big sports fan, especially a baseball fan. And I had some thoughts on, on how we might be able to stop hitting slumps in baseball, which is a whole other story. But I'd thought about this quite deeply and I'd in fact come up with a whole bunch of experiments that I thought we could do um, to kind of get at this. And when I applied to grad school, I very proudly included these experiments to show how deeply I'd thought about all this kind of stuff. Um, trying to show my research kind of mind, I guess. Um, I hadn't applied to many uh, grad schools. I applied to UNB, which is where I did my undergraduate. I didn't want to go there. I'd been there too long. Uh, I applied to UBC. That's where I wanted to go. Uh, mountain scuba diving. That's really where I wanted to go. And I also, for some reason, applied to the University of Waterloo. I'm not sure. I think it was close enough to Toronto to be exciting and far enough to be safe. I'm, I'm not really sure. At any rate, I got rejected by UBC in short order. Um, and then I got rejected by Waterloo. And I was kind of like bummed out because I didn't really want to stay in New Brunswick. I'd been in New Brunswick all my life. I was ready to do something different. And so I, I did something that I want to kind of suggest to you guys. And I want you to get the spirit of this. I called them at Waterloo and, and I said, um, you know, I was really looking forward to going to Waterloo. I thought I had a strong application, but obviously I didn't. There must be something I'm not understanding about the application process. I know you guys all, you know, looked at every candidate in detail and probably took some notes. I would really, really appreciate it if somebody could maybe give me a call back and, and talk to me about why my application was not attractive. Uh, and, and I know I'm not going to get in. I, I understand the decision and, and I respect the decision fully. I'm just thinking more about the future and what I could do differently and how I could improve my application. Okay. So first of all, I think that mindset really impressed them. I'm going to call that the revisionist mindset. And I'm mentioning it now because it's going to be part of your third phase of Peer Scholar. We're going to talk about this a lot. The power of being open to feedback and, and, and to show that desire to learn from feedback, to grow from feedback. Uh, and so that's what I was displaying to them. Hey, you know, I, I'd really like to grow. I'd really like to do better. Uh, and you guys have some information I could use. And so eventually a professor called me back um, and talked to me about all of the application thing a little bit more. And I again expressed, you know, just my position that I just wanted to learn. Um, I was not trying to talk my way in or whine. I just wanted to learn. And as we talked a little bit more, this professor, whose name was Phil Miracle, um, started to tell me a little bit about his research. And his research was on subliminal perception. Uh, and he said, did I find that interesting? And he said, one of the reasons your application was not attractive was because you clearly had thought so deeply about sports psychology and nobody there did sports psychology. So they didn't see a match. It wasn't that they didn't think, you know, I was potentially clever. It's that they didn't see a match. But as he spoke to me more, he said, well, if you're interested in subliminal perception, if you find that, I'm going to send you some papers, he said, and if you find that interesting, well, then let's talk. And so he sent me some papers. I, I looked at them very detailed. I thought critically. I tried to find flaws in the papers, things that could be done better. I responded with an email saying, I really enjoyed this, but I wondered if they thought of that or this. Uh, and that just led to a, an intellectual discussion with uh, Phil. Um, and ultimately, it led to me being accepted at University of Waterloo, which was not my goal. You know, I wasn't doing that to talk talk my way in, but it turns out I did. Um, okay, so why am I saying that here? First of all, because I'm going to tell you about some of the research I did. This is an area where I did a lot of work, and I think it fits at the end of chapter five as we're going into chapter six on consciousness. It'll kind of start get, getting your mind thinking about consciousness a little bit. Um, and so this is research, some of it from my PhD that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, the other reason, though, is as we're doing Peer Scholar, and especially as you're getting into steps two and three, the real focus is about developing your skills of thinking critically, of thinking creatively, of communicating your ideas well, but then also being able to listen to the ideas of others, think critically about them. Um, and if their ideas are res responding to your work, 
to think about whether they they have some good ideas that you should use uh, and whether you can actually learn how to do better by being exposed to the thoughts of other students around your work. So we're going to enter into a phase where we're going to work on those skills. We're going to exercise those skills. And the reason that's so important to me is just like the story I told you, I think those skills are the ones that ultimately will lead you to be first of all hired or accepted somewhere if they're looking to see can this person think critically can they think creatively can they have intellectual conversations um, but it will also allow you to succeed once you are you know in that program or in that job uh, and so it's a passion for me to try to exercise these skills for you peer scholars my to my primary tool to do it um, but so are lectures and stuff where i'm just trying to get you to think critically as we go Okay, so that was a long foreshadow. Uh, let's get right into this. Uh, and so, first of all, I, I think the textbook kind of went through this quick, a little quickly at the end. And so I want to unpack some of this and make you really understand the questions being asked. And so one of the interesting questions, not the most interesting to be honest, but one of the interesting questions that started or is related to the work on subliminal perception um, is this question of how sensitive are our sensory systems. So, you know, I've already told you that we're only sensitive to a little band of light, but the, now the question is, well, but how much of that light, even if something's in our bandwidth, you know, even if it is like a, a green light um, that's being shown, how bright does that green light have to be before we can detect it? That's what we really mean by sensitivity. Right? When is it that our eye is able to pick up that signal? Or how loud must a sound be for our ear to hear it? Or how strong must some touch be before we actually feel the touch? And so this is getting at the actual sensitivity of our sensory systems. Uh, and we would like to know that, right? We're trying to understand this machine that is us. And so we would like to know how sensitive these input systems are. But perhaps more interesting than that, and I hope you watch that Darren Brown video, um, there is this notion of, okay, that's really how strong a stimulus has to be until we're aware of it. Uh, but what happens when, we're, when it's less than that? Okay, so let me unpack this a little bit. Uh, and I didn't mean to be showing these things on the bottom. I just, uh, I messed up my animation. So let's just think of this line. Let's imagine stimulus energy. Now I'm using a general term. So this could be the loudness of a sound or the brightness of a light or the strength of a touch. You know, whatever. Imagine we go from, a, from no stimulus energy at all to a lots of stimulus energy. So strong, you know, a strong stimulus energy. And so when we're talking about sensitivity, we're saying, well, we're going to need so much energy before we become aware of the stimulus. So now I want to sneak in this awareness and subjective awareness. Because when we say how bright must a stimulus be until you see it, what we really mean is how bright must it be until you are aware of seeing it, right? This is the point we call this subjective awareness where, where now you can see the light or now you can hear that sound. It's strong enough that now you can hear it. But what we actually mean is you can hear it consciously. You're aware of hearing it, right? And so we can try to find that spot. Now, by the way, so let's get down here. That spot is often measured um, in experiments using, it's, it's called the Lyman. So literally they would present a stimulus at different energies, you know, sometimes very, very, very um, light. Let, let's stick with a light for now. So, so very non-bright, very dim, you know, so dim you don't even see it against the background, but they make it brighter and they make it brighter. Or what they would usually do is, is sometimes it would be dim, sometimes it would be really bright. So they would sample the space, right? Present stimuli and, and they would say, you're, you're just supposed to sit there and hit a button when you see something. Okay. And sometimes it's really bright and you see it. Sometimes you don't see anything. And so you're just sitting there. What we would like to find is the stimulus energy where 50% of the time you see it and 50% you don't. So when we present it at that level of energy, so if it's a light, you know, at this brightness, Half the time you're like, yep, I saw it. And half the time you're saying, no, we call that the Lyman. 
Uh, this has nothing to do with Sprite. <laughs> this is not a lemon and a lime put together. Um, it's a lime and it's a, it's a classic word of, of that line that separates not being aware from being aware of the stimulus. And again, we objectively define that as the point where a person says they're aware of the stimulus 50% of the time when we're presented at that brightness. So it's right at the line. If we present it any brighter than that, then they're gonna say they see it quite a bit. Any dimmer, then they're not gonna see it very much, right? And so that's the line, cool. And so here becomes the interesting question, boom. Is the brain processing information that is presented with an energy level below this limen? This is what the word subliminal or sub, sub means below, limen, all, <laughs> below the limen, right? If you present it with an energy that's very quiet or very dim, um, can you, is it the case that you can present a stimulus that we are not aware of but it's still getting into our brain and still biasing us. Okay, this is an this is a question that we sometimes call perception without awareness. You know, is there such a thing as perception without awareness? Now, when we say perception, now we don't just mean conscious perception, right? What we actually mean is the brain is is digesting that information. The information is into the brain and it's and it's having an effect but the person is not aware of it. Okay, so let me just jump back a little bit. I gave you the Darren Brown video to get you thinking about, excuse me, about subliminal perception. Um, if you search a little bit more crud, what's the band? Mm. So certainly the Rolling Stones were accused of this, but there was a famous, um, there was a famous court case where a band was, was talking about, um, well, let me say it this way. Um, it, Oh, it was a band. It's a metal band. One of you guys are going to have to tell me because because we want to search on YouTube for it to, so you can check it out. Um, but they were accused of embedding subliminals uh, into their um, songs. And the subliminal said, do it, do it, do it. Uh, and the notion was parents thought that well so, so so some parents had children who loved that music, who listened to that music a lot, uh, and some of those children committed suicide. And the parents of the children who committed suicide accused the, the um, subliminals. They, they said that there were subliminal th things on there that were convincing their children to kill themselves. The do it, do it, do it being kill themselves. And that the children were hearing this without awareness, uh, and, but that it was the ultimate cause of them killing themselves. Okay. And so there was a lot of, uh, this was a court case, a, a, a big court case. And it turns out Phil Miracle, my supervisor, um, testified at that court case because he had done a bunch of research um, suggesting that, that that sort of subliminal effect was unlikely, um, that, that you couldn't make someone do something like kill themselves without them having any awareness of the stimulus. So at any rate, he was part of that whole, was it Iron Maiden? No, it wasn't Iron Maiden, I don't think. Uh, but he was part of that whole kind of thing. And so I was finding out about this when he said, hey, are you interested in this question, perception without awareness? And I thought that's kind of a cool question. It's kind of interesting. I am kind of interested in that. And so we started doing research together. Um, we wanted to try to do um, research that tied a number of controversies um, together. But I, I don't know. I don't want to get into it too much because there's always a lot of depth to any given research project. And I won't give you too much depth. Let me just give you the idea of what, of what we did to try to get at this question. Does subliminal perception occur? Um, yeah. Okay, let's just jump in. Welcome to my PhD. I first have to introduce you to the Stroop effect. Um, and the Stroop effect is often a, a task used to measure automatic processing or the sort of processing that happens without conscious thought. And so it has come sometimes seen as a cool way to get at perception without awareness because we know this effect occurs even when people are not aware or yeah, I mean, let me slow down. Let's just talk about what the effect is. So you see the stimuli on the screen ahead of uh, uh, up here, but what you may not realize, I have to make a distinction and I should have marked it on the slide. Actually, you may want to. The top ones, the five on the top are what we're going to call congruent stimuli. 
The five on the bottom are what we're going to call incongruent stimuli. What we mean by that is for the five on the top, the word blue is written in blue. The word yellow is written in yellow, red and red, purple and purple, black and black. So the color and the word are the same. They are congruent. They, they, they imply the same color, right? Whereas on the bottom, we have the word blue written in yellow and yellow written in red, red written in blue, purple written in green, black written in purple. Uh, and so now the color and the word are not congruent. They are incongruent. Okay. If you ask people, if you show them a bunch of items like this and you say, all I want you to do is to name the color that that word is printed in. So for the top, we would say blue, yellow, red, purple, black. For the bottom, we would say yellow, red, blue, green, purple. You probably already sensed with me right there that the incongruent are harder to name. When you look at people's reaction time to, to name the colors of these things, yellow, red, blue, green, purple, um, they are slower for incongruent than for congruent, and there's more errors. So people have trouble reading the color of these incongruent ones. Why? Because they can't control word reading. We have read for so long from such a young age, we've practiced reading over and over and the claim is it is now automatic. We're getting into some of the terms that'll be relevant to the consciousness chapter here. So what we mean by automatic is you don't need conscious awareness. When your eyes fall on a word, your brain just starts reading it. Even if it's annoying you, even if you're trying to read the color and, and the, the, the reading the word is messing up with your ability to read the color, you still can't seem to turn it off. It's like this word reading just happens automatically uh, and produces the Stroop effect. Okay. If you want to try it yourself, here's a website you can go to. It's got a little demo. Go through it and you'll see for yourself. Okay, so this was the starting point and this is how real research happens and that's part of what I want to do with this video is give you a sense of, of real research. You would start with some phenomenon like this and you'd say, okay, that's kind of cool. Now, can we twist it in a weird way to get at the question we want to get at? And here's what we did. So, um, we did a two color variant of the Stroop task. I'm gonna walk you through this stuff. So don't, so don't worry too much about reading everything yet. Um, let me walk you through it. Let me first just walk you through how a trial happened. So there would be a plus sign that would be there for some amount of time. I don't know, 500 milliseconds, half a second. Then you would see a word. The word would always be either red or green. Those were the only two words you'd ever see, red or green. After the word was shown, and I'll get to how long it was shown, after the word was shown, it's followed by something we call a mask, which is just a bunch of stimuli like this. And the idea of a mask is if we show you a word and then cover it up with a mask, then it gets very hard to, to see what was just shown. It sort of terminates processing of that previous stimulus. Uh, if you didn't show the mask, if you just showed red, the processing would continue and you would be able to see it even if it was shown for a very brief time. Um, the eyes are really good at keeping it alive. We're going to talk about that in the memory chapter. But if you cover it with a mask, so you present the word and you cover it with a mask, now people only had as long to see it as it was there before the mask came on. And then the mask kind of terminates processing. So quite often, if this is really quick, that it goes from here to there, people will just feel like they just saw a little bit of a flicker, and then this is what they see, the mask. And say, that stays there for a little while, and then there's a patch. What people are asked to do is with two fingers, just tell me whether that color patch is red or green as quickly as you can. That's all you're doing. You're watching these things unfold and then there's a patch and you're saying red or green. And we're measuring your response time and your accuracy. Okay, so we've got all that set up, right? Cross the word either red or green masked and then a patch either red or green and you respond to it. Okay. So now let me add the twist. We tell people this at the beginning, on 80% of the trials, the color will be opposite the previous word. So that's what I've shown you here. If the word is red, you'll get a green patch. If the word is green, you'll get a red patch. But 
notice that this requires you to kind of apply a strategy or apply a, a transformation, which is conscious front, frontal lobes, right? I see red, so I expect green. Oh, there's green, so expect red. So it's kind of uh, a, a strategy that your brain has to employ. Um, can it do it? I'll show you in a second. Um, but here's the here's the the critical independent variable, the critical thing we manipulate right here. Everything else is just sort of the, the situation. But we either present this below a participant's Lyman, which is usually around 50 milliseconds, um, or we present it above the Lyman, 200 milliseconds. So what that means is either they're not really going to be able to see this, it, it'll just be a flicker, or it'll be there for 200 milliseconds, which is actually quite a bit of time for the mind. The mind can easily pick that up in 200 milliseconds and be aware of what was there. So they either won't be aware of this or they will be aware of this. And the question is, well, do we see any evidence that even when it's below the Lyman that they're aware of it? And can we be sure that that evidence we see isn't just normal processing sneaking in that sometimes they were aware even below the Lyman and that's what you see. So what we've tried to create is a situation where what they will do when they are aware is different than what they'll do if they're perceiving without awareness. Because of this, 80% of the trials, the color will be opposite the previous word. So that our claim is when they're aware of red, then they can expect the opposite. Or when they're aware of green, they, then they can expect the opposite. But if they're not aware, then, so they didn't even see if that was the word red or green, now they cannot expect the opposite. So what should we see instead? We should see a normal Stroop effect. We should see them fastest when these two match, congruent, versus when they don't. But when they're aware, now we should see the opposite because they're expecting the opposite, right? They see red, they're expecting green. So when green comes up, they're quicker. So we expect when they're aware, they will show a reverse Stroop effect, being faster on incongruent than congruent. I may have messed your heads up there. Let me just show you the data and, and the data confirm exactly to what we, we would suggest. When you present those words subliminally, you find the usual Stroop effect. People are faster on incongruent than on congruent. And they're also uh, more accurate, by the way. I don't show this here, but on incongruent, or sorry, on congruent than incongruent. So we're seeing a typical Stroop effect when you're presenting them subliminally. What does that mean, by the way? That means the words are getting in, right? They're seeing those primes um, because it's having an effect. The, the identity of the word is having an effect. It's congruency with the color is having an effect. So clearly people are seeing sorry, clearly the words are getting into the brain, into the mind, even though the participants say they are not aware of those words. How can we be sure this isn't a little bit of awareness left over, that sometimes they see it? Well, because we have this condition where we allow them to be fully aware, and we know that when they're fully aware, something else happens. So specifically, we're seeing a reverse Stroop effect. We're seeing them faster on incongruent than congruent. Why? Because we told them that most of the trials were incongruent, 80%. And so they've learned when I see red, expect green, expect the opposite. And when they get the opposite, they're quick. But when you actually say, here's red, and they expect green, and then they get red, which is the congruent, now they're slow because it goes against their expectation. So we know this is what they do when they're aware of the stimulus. But if we present it a little briefer, we find they do the complete opposite, okay? An opposite pattern of behavior. And it's this sort of data, what we sometimes call a qualitative difference, that really suggests that this Lyman means something. That somewhere between that line, awareness of the stimulus kicks in, and that awareness can allow consciousness to do things with the information, like expect the opposite. But even below that Lyman, the stimulus is still being perceived. It's still getting into the mind. Uh, and so what does this say about subliminal perception? It says there is subliminal perception. We do have the ability to perceive things we are not aware of. Um, now, to get, go back to that court case, um, I 
think it was Iron Maiden actually, to go back to that court case. Um, remember, I said my supervisor, who's part of this research, said said that that subliminal perception could not make someone kill themselves. And and there's a line there. So we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next chapter. But certainly, information we're not perceiving does get in. There's no doubt about that now. Um, but it seems like it just biases the way we perceive things. It doesn't, it's not like some little, we can't use it as a little force that makes us do things like not eat junk food or study better or exercise more. You know, it's not this idea of using subliminals to kind of talk to your unconscious mind. It's all very Freudian and there's no evidence to suggest any of that exists or works. But you do perceive things and, and they do float around. And they can bias you later, for example, when you're asked to come up for of an idea for an ad. You know, these things that you've sort of half seen and half processed and weren't really aware of, um, you nonetheless, you know, later when, when you're thinking about something, those things can sneak into your conscious awareness. Um, you want, you're not aware of having seen them, but they sneak in and, and influence uh, the way you're doing things. So there's this interesting dance between the things that we're processing deeply, but these other things that we're seeing and not processing deeply. Let me just say, by the way, um, here's the paper in case you're interested um, of, of that I've been talking about that you can go check out. But notice that I also say parallels between perception without attention and perception without awareness. I, I may talk about this in the next chapter. What we actually did in this paper is I showed that data pattern that I just showed you as a function of the duration of the stimulus. How much energy did we present? And, and did we make it so hard to perceive because it was so quick? But we also later did the same experiment where we didn't have it quick. We had it super liminal in both conditions, but in one condition we divided people's attention. So they weren't, that their mind was sort of somewhere else while it was clearly presented. And if you divide their attention, they behave just like when it's presented briefly, okay? And so this is the reality, and this is more like the Darren Brown one. What, what was going on with those people when they were being driven into work is their attention was divided. They weren't really focusing on any of that stuff. And so it was presented clearly enough. There was enough stimulus energy that they could have been aware of the zoo gates or whatever, um, but because their mind was elsewhere, they weren't processing it that deeply. And so they were perceiving that stuff without awareness. So perceiving things without attention is the same as perceiving without awareness. Uh, and that should mess up your mind a little bit, but lead us well into the consciousness chapter. So I will see you there. Um, and this is the last uh, lecture for chapter five. Thank you. Bye-bye.